Hello, and welcome to this Hopkins at Home webinar on super spreading events, lessons from India on containment of COVID-19. This event is being hosted by the Johns Hopkins India Institute. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you who celebrated, I hope you had a wonderful Diwali holiday. I'm Jennifer Nuzzo, Associate Professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And I'm very excited to be moderating this discussion. Today we'll be talking about research that, John, that the Johns Hopkins India Institute did to better understand COVID transmission in two Indian states, which helps shed light on the nature and impact of super spreading events. This study is incredibly timely. Health experts are increasingly realizing the importance of super spreading events during, in driving the overall transmission of COVID-19. And as we approach the fall and winter months, understanding these transmission events and how to interrupt them will be increasingly important. But much of what we know about super spreading comes from a limited number of studies from high resource settings. We can and should learn about how COVID-19 is being transmitted, including in resource set, low resource settings where the majority of cases are occurring. Today, we're lucky to hear from two world-class experts on this topic. Dr. Brian Wall is an epidemiologist in the Department of International Health at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Based in Delhi, Dr. Wall has broad interest in the relationship between health systems and infectious diseases in low and middle income countries. And his research focuses on understanding the changing epidemiology of pediatric respiratory diseases in the context of new health interventions. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Sanjay Mendele, Director of Research at PD Hiduja Hospital and Medical Research Center in Mumbai. Dr. Mendele has a 38 year career in medical research and previously served as the additional director general of the Indian Council of Medical Research, which is one of the world's top biomedical research organizations. Dr. Mendele's research interests include HIV AIDS and rotavirus, vaccine trials, health systems research, and socio-behavioral studies related to high risk populations. During this discussion, we welcome you to ask any questions you may have by typing them in the chat module on the screen throughout the talk, and we'll leave time at the end to answer them. So I'm very excited about this, so let's jump right in. And I'm gonna ask first um, Dr. Brian Wall to just um, tell us a bit about what you learned about transmission of COVID-19 in India. Great, thank you, Jennifer. So we worked very closely with the governments of both Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu to analyze their contact tracing data um, that has been collected by community health workers since the beginning of the epidemic in both of those states. Uh, intensive house-to-house -house surveillance in both states started around uh, March 28th, just a few days after the national lockdown was put into place in India. And you can see here on the screen the timing uh, of our study, the study period in gray, the lockdown period here indicated at the top, and the uh, increase in cases, confirmed cases in both Tamil Nadu in Maroon and Andhra Pradesh in uh, Teal. And you can see down uh, toward the bottom of the screen, the uh, increase in daily deaths in both of these states over time. Much of um, what we know about COVID, as Jennifer was mentioning, comes from uh, uh, at one uh, earlier this year, came largely from China, uh, as well as high income countries, primarily in Europe and North America. However, now a majority of the global population at risk and where most confirmed cases and deaths have occurred uh, are in low and middle income countries. And so while there is a need for, and so there's a need for additional data um, from countries like India, um, but it is also important to not divert limited resources, funding, medical supplies, and human resources from critical response efforts. And so I'm really, one of the things that I'm really proud of with this research is that we were able to um, do this without um, uh, diverting uh, those limited resources and we were able to use routine public health data. So regarding some of the key findings from our study, one of the key findings is that as with in other settings, we found that um, a uh, that super spreaders play an important role in fueling the epidemic. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, but you can see um, here on this slide, the total number of contacts that were traced for um, tested for each uh, primary 
uh, case. And here are the total contacts that were positive. And this inset here um, indicates that uh, the uh, percentile of index cases who um, contributed to secondary cases. And the thing that we, uh, what we found was that 5% of index cases are responsible for approximately 80% of secondary cases. In addition, we also found that there is an increased likelihood of cases infecting contacts of similar ages. Um, children are also active participants in transmission. They are not the drivers of transmission, but they do play uh, a role in transmission. We also found that the median time to death in these two states was only five to six days after being hospitalized, which is um, much shorter than the 15 or 16 days that we found in, in other settings. And last, we also found that there were some settings um, where transmission was more likely. For, ex for example, extended travel in shared vehicles dramatically increased the probability of secondary infections. I'm, I'm happy to talk more about any of these findings um, uh, as, as we uh, move forward with our discussion today. Great, thank you, Brian, that was really interesting. Um, I'd like to just jump in with some questions and um, maybe I'll uh, start with you, Dr. Mahendale. Um, you have been working for a long time on infectious diseases in India. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are, first of all, on what lessons are emerging um, in India's response to COVID-19 that you think are worth sharing. And then also I'm curious if, um, you know, based on your experience with other infectious diseases, you know, what lessons have we learned um, in combating those that we should also be thinking about and applying to COVID-19? Hi, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, well, it, it was very important that uh, we realized that surveillance is the key here. There was a lot of debate that happened all over the country. People kept challenging the issue of whether or not this particular epidemic was concentrated in India or it became community spread uh, over a period of time. In, the, in approximately two to three months from the start of the epidemic, epidemiologists and experts in the country started uh, saying that uh, the the whole point in focusing this uh, issue on concentrated consider is actually happening. I think all of this debate probably uh, brings in one particular aspect very strongly, and that is uh, surveillance has to be a very strong, uh, strongly built in the country. And this we have learned over a period of time. Uh, somehow the mechanisms that exist uh, in the country, we do have a very strong healthcare infrastructure system, but we don't have a very strong uh, surveillance network built around this. Indian Council of Medical Research has set up a very recently set up a virology diagnostic research laboratory network by involving more than 250 medical colleges across the country here. And they are testing very routinely uh, the samples that are referred to them for various uh, agents, definitely considering the possibility of novel agents. They do keep in mind that there is a possibility that they might be seeing something which is which has not been seen so far in the country. So surveillance is the key, is the first point. I believe uh, this is what we have learned. Second thing is we do also lack in effective communication. That's what uh, I realized. And to strengthen the communication, communication not only among the healthcare workers, uh, educating the healthcare workers adequately, educating the media, educating the common people. We do require uh, to have different kinds of channels, different kinds of platforms. And uh, somehow this, uh, this kind of an approach has been lacking and uh, we should be doing something more on, on this, this front for sure. As far as data collection is concerned, uh, certainly uh, regarding the surveillance network part of it. But uh, whenever we do any kind of surveillance, it has to be backed up by adequate data collection. The, there were issues which were raised over a period of time as to how, uh, say, uh, in terms of uh, real time, was our data really coming in time? 
and uh, to a certain extent certain states in india did have data that that they were showing to people uh, in in real time but there were other states uh, where it was felt that something more definitely could have been done and so this probably is another area where and this has happened in uh, even in the past in in case of some of the previous instances as well and uh, probably a need was felt that we will probably need to work on uh, this very effectively uh, i feel another thing which probably is important is while communicating with people probably very common messages across the countries have to go there are different agencies which come up with different kinds of answers different kinds of numbers and people get confused in the long run so could there be some very specific agencies which people could rely on uh, then if it is the ministry of health of government of india that people have to rely on then uh, what exactly do we do when conflicting results come up in the media from other agencies also so uh, i i really do not know how to sort out this uh, this kind of a problem in a huge country like ours but we do need to address uh, that that issue perfectly well and the last point which i would make jennifer on this uh, in this particular regard is that india has done pretty well in terms of uh, uh, the support and involvement of biotechnology industry in the health uh, health sector in a big way uh, see this was one of the reasons why uh, indigenous kit development uh, was possible and we had our own kit uh, which got approved in the month of uh, uh, late march uh, early april and then there were several other kits which got developed of course the need for, need of the country is so huge that uh, the number of kits that we required we definitely had to uh, import kits from other parts of the world as well but we definitely were able to show or uh, at least we were able to document that we have capability of uh, responding in time Uh, by producing diagnostic kits even uh, we, we we will talk about this at some time point later but even the uh, there is a uh, the uh, the industrial support which has been given in the country where seven or eight different vaccine de- development platforms are also working very strongly so uh, there were certain points like uh, surveillance communication and data management uh, which we feel and appreciate that they require a lot of improvement but at the same time we also feel that uh, the industry involvement has has been very good in the country and uh, that is something which we have uh, experienced in the current pandemic thank you jennifer Thank you so much for that. And um, I'd actually like to get into that a little bit more and maybe both you and, and Brian uh, could weigh in on this. And uh, I've heard interesting things about testing approaches in India. And I'm just wondering um, if you could, um, you know, either one of you or both um, say a bit more about what the current approach to surveillance for COVID-19 is and um, how uh, you've made that uh, work um, from the beginning to now. Uh Okay, uh, maybe I will start and then Brian, sure. you can uh, express your view, uh, views uh, later. Uh, initially, uh, as as you all know, and as the whole world responded to that, because basically we were constrained uh, by the resources in terms of the facilities, the laboratories available, and also the diagnostic kits available. Uh, what was happening was essentially those people who were uh, either the contacts of uh, diagnosed COVID people who were returning from abroad where the uh, COVID cases were being reported, they were the ones, and people who were in uh, high-risk categories like uh, people in healthcare sector, people working in police sector, uh, people working in various other uh, supporting service sectors where who were a lot of public contact was possible these were the ones where mostly the focus of uh, surveillance was uh, given in general and uh, but this particular equation as to number of tests that is required and uh, uh, to be done and the number of test kits that was available i think this always in a country like india which is so huge there would always be a gap so even if you would think of increasing your number of test availability and pr- probably try to bring down uh, your say, so called uh, bar from uh, trying to just restrict screening only to people with high risk uh, behavior to community based screening or by doing surveys at the community level that was not happening mainly because uh, 
for the, we didn't have enough number of kits available. But as you can see now, as uh, I, I just was looking through the statistics which was uh, available here, the, the number of tests which have been done uh, over the last week uh, is 7.8 million. Uh, so this number has tremendously increased over uh, and the, the, we started really tracking in the recent times the positivity rate against the number of actual tests that has been performed. So that was a huge step that happened and wherein we were able to offer the number of tests to all those so, uh, who actually felt that they could get themselves tested as well. So uh, this, I, I believe, uh, was a transition which happened uh, from some people's point of view it might have got delayed by a couple of weeks, by a couple of months. But I believe it's a, it's a point of, uh, or it's a matter of uh, actually having the adequate resources to manage the pandemic of this kind in a country like ours. So uh, as of now, I would say, the you know, testing facility is available in a very large number of centers all over the country. And uh, people who feel that they need to get themselves tested are encouraged to get uh, themselves uh, tested. Particularly, uh, a lot of emphasis has been given on uh, creating awareness among people on to what prototypic symptoms could be, which are related to COVID. And if anybody uh, probably notes these kinds of symptoms, either in the family or somewhere close by, then they, they should encourage people to go, to go and get themselves tested. So that's the kind of current strategy, This uh, what we have. Brian, would, we, would you like to add anything? Dr. Mendeley, I think that was a fantastic overview of, of um, uh, the testing strategy that has been used all over India. The only thing I would add is that uh, what we found in both Andhra Pradesh as well as Tamil Nadu is that there was a dramatic increase um, early on in the epidemic in the daily number of tests that were being done. Um, test positivity early uh, in, in the epidemic uh, jumped up um, uh, upwards of, of 20 to 30 percent um, early in the, the epidemic, but um, as testing uh, capacity increased over time, that positivity came down uh, well below uh, the five percent kind of target that we that we look for. The other thing that I would just add is, um, and I, I would be interested to hear Dr. Mendeley's uh, uh, and, and, and Dr. Nuzo's um, opinions on this. Some states in, in India have also dramatically increased the use of rapid antigen tests um, in, uh, in their surveillance um, and, and testing strategy. And of course, um, there's uh, uh, a belief that um, uh, rapid antigen tests have lower sensitivity for, um, for cases compared to RT-PCR. Um, and what that potentially means for uh, the confirmed cases and, and test positivity. But, um, but a lot of states are using rapid antigen tests uh, to supplement their, their testing strategies. Yeah, I would love to hear if there, if you know of any emerging lessons from that. It's clearly a, a topic that a lot of the world is wrestling with needing to get faster results and to distribute um, testing uh, more broadly. So if there are any early impressions on how that's working, I think it would be quite interesting to hear. Well, uh, my views on this are- Too early uh, to tell. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry, can I? Please do. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, one important uh, thing which was possible because of introduction of antigen detection kits was that we were able to probably initiate testing at much less sophisticated labs as we can all imagine because uh, uh, having uh, as having a facility to do rt pcr tests would essentially mean having a pretty sophisticated lab and uh, just by introducing antigen testing, uh, various states that actually went into this kind of a state were able to extend the number of labs that were available to test out people with this strategy. But as was very rightly pointed out by Brian earlier, one of the important points which keeps getting discussed all the time is uh, about the low sensitivity part of it. But what is then uh, happening is then all those who are negative then are uh, getting tested uh, for RT-PCR. And we have seen some instances here because what happens is, uh, so I, I see a couple of challenges with this kind of approach. And that's it, that is, 
see uh, if you test uh, a particular individual who at that point uh, is uh, with a rapid antigen test detects uh, is detected as negative uh, but then because there is a huge backlog uh, of uh, the samples to be tested with rt pcr positive and so whenever his sample gets uh, actually lined up for rt pcr testing if there is a uh, say lag of couple of days before that actually happens we are losing that precious time because if that is a case classically which could have been picked up by rt pcr earlier uh, that gets missed and there is a possibility that some transmission would actually be happening during this particular period of time but that again uh, is an issue of resource sharing as i would say uh, if we would be doing only rt pcr testing then we are able to offer this test to a pretty less number of people as one can imagine whereas if uh, antigen detection elisa is uh, rolled out in a very big number then there there would be instances the way uh, of the kind which i just described in which few people would be missed uh, but there would be others who would be detected as well uh, much faster so uh, i i suppose this is this is a balance which probably one needs to keep thinking about the only answer to that would be to improve the efficiency of the uh, and efficacy of the uh, uh, rapid antigen test so that uh, the uh, any kind of false negatives associated with this over a period of time go on decreasing uh, and then we have more and more reliance on uh, uh, antigen detection test as a as an important first step and then only uh, uh, this becomes a pretty effective test to be applied on a large scale or on a mass scale thank you thank for you. that really, really interesting insights um brian maybe turn it back to you uh, Uh, diagnostic technologies aren't the only technology that have been used in responding to COVID-19. And I'm curious about mobile technologies and the extent to, to which they're being used in India and how they're being used. And, you know, do you see them as an important factor in the response? Yeah, that's a, a great question, uh, Jennifer. So um, in, in a lot of settings um, uh, in India, such as Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, Um, which already have uh, relatively strong public health systems in place, um, the contact tracing and surveillance efforts um, that really enabled us to do this analysis um, on, on super spreading and, and other um, uh, epidemiologic uh, aspects of COVID in India um, relied on, on regular and, and rapid um, uh, reporting Of, of the contact tracing surveillance data um, uh, in both of these states. And that was really made feasible by um, mobile technologies. Um, one other uh, aspect of, um, uh, of the response that I've observed um, in other states, um, but I'm sure it's happening in Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and elsewhere, is really the use of mobile technology for training. Um, uh, a lot of uh, training efforts um, are not feasible um, due to uh, limitations in, in bringing people together and um, the amount of time it would take to, to bring people together. And so the use of, of mobile technologies, smartphones in particular, even among uh, community health workers um, within villages have, has really enabled um, uh, training on a, on a scale um, that might not have been Um, possible even just a couple of years ago um, before smartphones um, uh, were so widely used even at the, um, the community level um, among, among ASHA workers and, um, and A&Ms. And so um, that is, I think, one way that mobile technology has really um, allowed uh, the um, response to be strengthened in a lot of places Um, in India as well, including training for, for surveillance efforts. That's great. Um, I think I now have a better sense of the larger surveillance and response context in India. And um, I'd like now to maybe turn back to this topic of super spreading and super spreader spreading events. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot about this. Um, I'm interested in your data that's showing that 5% um, as potentially being responsible for the majority, for 5% of cases potentially being 
responsible for um, the vast majority of, of subsequent cases um, that I think tracks, although possibly even lower with some of some of the limited data that we have in other settings. And maybe just taking a step back, um, we have limited, we, we, we're hearing a lot more about super spreading, um, but we do have limited data on these events. So maybe you could just tell us a bit about why super spreading events are so important in terms of the overall transmission of COVID-19 and um, why do we need more data, you know, particularly from other settings? That's sort of the one of the conceits of this meeting is that um, we're getting data from perhaps a much different environment that we may have otherwise um, uh, learned about through some of the published literature. And um, wh what are you finding and, you know, what are the larger lessons from that? Absolutely. So, so as you mentioned, uh, we found that 5% uh, of primary cases were responsible for 80% of secondary cases. And, and the, the flip side of that, the other side of the coin is that 70% of, of primary cases did not result in another um, infected case. Uh, and so I get questions from, from my friends and colleagues uh, in, in Delhi um, quite often um, uh, coming to me saying, you know, we only, uh, we had someone test positive in our house. Nobody else tested positive. Um, nobody else uh, became infected. Can this, can this really be the case? Um, and so, uh, you know, this 70% this of, of cases that didn't result in a, in, a, in a secondary case, I think really points to that. Um, but it's at five percent that's really driving the 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 epidemic, um, and and this is what we've seen in other places. I agree that there's limited data um, from from many settings, but we have seen in data from both Hong Kong as well as China that uh, that um, these super spreading events um, are what is driving uh, the the epidemic in a lot of places. We don't really know a lot about the determinants of super spreading. Uh, it's likely to be a function of, of social interaction patterns of the host and, and others, um, the environment, as well as biological characteristics. Um, but I think it's really important um, now knowing that uh, super spreaders are really driving the epidemic to identify the characteristics of settings where super spreading events are, are likely to occur, um, which will help us in, in identifying um, effective control measures um, and also uh, setting, um, setting up screening um, uh, in, in, in some of those settings as well. Um, and this is really important. And one of the reasons why it's important to have um, these data from India is because a lot of these characteristics um, are going to be uh, context specific. Um, I also think that super spreading um, and, and uh, knowing that, that super spreading is what's driving the epidemic, it raises important questions about how we think about contact tracing. So in Japan and elsewhere, um, public health agencies have used uh, retrospective contact tracing. So looking further back into to trains of transmission to identify the clusters um, that are really driving um, the epidemic, and they've used this to, you know, in really effective ways. Uh, and and I think um, it's important to note that retrospective contact tracing is resource intensive, and it's going to be particularly difficult in settings like India. Um, but I think uh, it's really important to better understand the barriers to uh, retrospective contact tracing uh, so that we can work to overcome them. I also think that um, in settings, several states across India um, are now coming off of their, uh, their initial peaks, um, uh, epidemic peaks. And so as cases decrease in several settings and um, it's, it could potentially be more feasible to initiate retrospective contract uh, contact tracing um, if there are fewer cases uh, that, that would require this kind of retrospective contact tracing. And I think this is, um, uh, uh, I think one of the ways in which um, super spreading and understanding super spreading um, uh, affects our response to the epidemic um, in places like India. And I guess following up on that, I mean, are there any kind of extensions of this um, for policymaking, any practices that you think, I mean, we're, um, obviously there's uh, implications for contact tracing, but are there kind of broader 
policy implications potentially from from your findings or do you think it's too early to tell? No, I, I, I think um, as I was mentioning, understanding um, the characteristic of, characteristics of settings where super spreading events are occurring, I think is, is really important. Um, in, uh, you, you started off by, um, by wishing everybody uh, who celebrates uh, Diwali um, a happy Diwali, of course. And, and um, this, uh, uh, in many parts of the country, um, uh, as the weather gets cooler and as um, uh, we, we go into the holiday um, period, I think understanding as well these kinds of uh, um, uh, gatherings that could potentially contribute to super spreading um, uh, should inform policy making. Um, I'm not sure to the extent um, um, in many places that it has. I would be interested to hear um, Dr. Mendeley's uh, uh, thoughts on this, but um, I think thinking through um, at least the characteristics of these kind of super spreading events um, should be informing policy making. One, one additional thing um, that I'll mention is uh, a key finding from our, our work was that um, there were a couple of high risk um, uh, settings uh, where we saw the probability of transmission increase dramatically. So shared um, transportation for, um, uh, for a period of over six hours, for example, um, we saw the secondary attack rate jump upwards of, uh, jump up to upwards of 80%. Um, and I think that that, you know, has a lot of, um, uh, that should have implications for thinking through um, interstate uh, train travel, interstate um, bus travel, um, and, uh, and, and whether those, um, whether there should be measures put into place to try and limit transmission in those settings. Great, and um, turning to you, Dr. Mahendale, um, you, um, you know, just looking ahead, I mean, what's, what do you think is in store for India in the coming weeks to months? Um, you know, the, the curve is looking uh, much better than it had been, and certainly much better than a number of other countries right now. Um, what do you, do you think that this is, um, you know, a sustainable track uh, that India is on, or do you, um, what's your, 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 um, look ahead and um, maybe are there sort of risks on the horizon that um, you, you may be concerned about? Yeah, uh, Jennifer, but before I get into that, give me a couple of moments to just also uh, give me some of my opinions about this issue of super spreaders here in the Please country. Do. This definitely is an interesting proposition and the data which uh, Brian has shown uh, definitely uh, puts us to think about this particular possibility very strongly. Now, uh, how do we do and how do we track this in India? Definitely, I agree with what he's saying and uh, this cannot be done in the program mode, for sure. Healthcare systems definitely are not geared up to track this down in, a, in the systematic way, both forward uh, testing as well as the backward contact tracing. So this is going to be very tough. If at all one has to do it, it has to be done in the research mode. Now, this complicates the issue a little bit because what's going to happen is uh, as uh, the, the, that brings me to the next point which you talked about as to what is happening right now and what's going to happen in the future. See, if uh, what the trends show right now is that most of the states have started showing a downward trend, but does it mean that we are uh, coming close to end of this particular epidemic in the country? probably it will be too early to make this kind of a comment. Many other countries in the West we have seen uh, that had shown a reasonable progress as far as uh, showing improvements in the number of case reporting is concerned over a period of time, have faced a significant challenge in the recent times uh, with the return of the second wave. Uh, whether that would happen in India, we do not know. This festive season, uh, which Brian referred to, we this is a season again of a very important Diwali festival, which is celebrated all over the country, which uh, has allowed uh, people to come. Uh, this is something where people come together, celebrate together as families. And uh, so uh, here is where you, are, you lay your bars down to some extent. You are not, uh, probably you do not, are not so careful about 
all the uh, the important measures that you have been taught for the last 8 to 10 months now that's one the gradually the withdrawal of the lockdown what has been happening is there is gradually things are opening up the trains have started uh, gradually people are being allowed to travel the restaurant uh, restaurants are opening with 50% capacity as of now but over a period of time another 15 days 20 days 30 days we will start opening up fully malls are open already shopping is going on full scale we do not know what's going to happen really truly speaking we do not know and we also do not have very systematically worked out surveys which are nationally representative which can tell us whether we have uh, we have developed as a nation adequate response uh, which uh, response or adequate antibodies to this particular virus in uh, a desired percentage of population which we can consider as uh, possibly herd immunity let me not bring up that issue at all because we don't know we haven't tested it uh, very systematically but if at all we have to uh, assume as to what is going to assume is we always have to be prepared uh, uh, well going by the experience of the west as of now uh, although uh, people have seen a declining trend there's in many cases there have been increase in the number of cases that has happened probably because of the slackening of measures uh, that has happened probably and you know i i don't i don't blame people for this also uh, it's a human nature it's a behavioral issue and you know behavior is very difficult to control uh, in all the situation if people have been asked to modify their behaviors and they, they have been asked to change behavior and uh, behavior in a behave in a particular way for 8 to 10 months you if you are going to ask them to continue to uh, behave themselves in another 6 months for another 6 months another 12 months that's not going to happen so uh, i i suppose it's going to be some level of uh, some level of trade off which will keep happening here Uh, i would still say that uh, uh, i'm not too sure if the second wave per se will happen but certain peaks will keep happening and uh, we we certainly will see different kinds of peaks happening in different parts of the states all of us know that uh, the we we are a huge country and uh, we have seen the epidemic which uh, the two states which uh, brian worked in uh, in addition to that the state of maharashtra these were the states which contributed extensively uh, and including delhi they were the front runners as far as the number of cases are concerned in the country so how these would behave as far as uh, the the in the next couple of months and what would happen to those states which were not showing so large number of cases in the earlier period only times will prove it so probably we will need to keep a close watch on that but one thing is one thing i'm particularly uh, say sort of i would like to stress heavily and that is we should not slacken on number of testings that have been happening all around we should continue to test people all over the country and even when uh, uh, say we are uh, expecting that uh, there has been radically decreased number of uh, cases which has been happening tests should be available to all they should be available as and when people want to get themselves tested uh, only then we will be able to track the way the things are happening so uh, i don't i don't want to be uh, uh, say an astrologer to give you a clear solution as to what's going to happen i i would just say that we will have to wait and watch uh, we will have the other coming uh, say 6 to 8 weeks are going to be pretty crucial to us because they are going to tell us as to what's going to happen Uh, in this huge country and maybe just a quick follow up to that um before i turn to the um question and answer from the uh viewers is um what i think what we've seen in other countries is that when they have lifted restrictions um unless there are targeted interventions that follow testing tracing um in isolation and quarantine that the case numbers ultimately start to rise and they may have to reimplement lockdowns and i'm curious what you think the kind of prospects are for those sort of targeted interventions going forward or if or if um if you know additional uh, kind of societal restrictions are are probable i i think yes this, this is again something which will have to be thought of very carefully what you say is absolutely correct if we go on uh, say sort of maintaining our network of uh, keeping the tests continuously on and we keep encouraging people to get themselves tested 
to have all those who uh, turn out to be positive brought under the continuum of care network and follow them up for adequate period of time do required kind of contact tracing and then provide all kind of advice counseling regarding uh, stoppage of uh, onward stoppage of uh, further spread of this particular disease big yes. important aspect here so winding up of uh, the health infrastructure that has been created to take care of extra load of the number of cases that has been happening we should not be very hasty is what i would say well, i mean what is also naturally happening is there are many facilities which have been created in the country which are in addition to the normal hospitals there have been setups and facilities which have been created to take care of people like in quarantine uh, facilities have been created where people can be housed for a certain period of time and there has been some kind of uh, uh, say sort of drives to uh, uh, to say wind them down but i suppose we have to go little slowly on this particular aspect i can imagine it's a it's an issue of money also because maintaining such facilities also requires of money and so but these risks have to be taken appropriately these are the calculated risks i think so for how long do we maintain such facilities and when we start withdrawing them uh, this has to be very nicely and closely monitored and here is where some expert opinion counts uh, a lot probably you were earlier referring to the issue of policy is here is where some people should come up and uh, sit together and draw a very clear policy as to what are the clear steps that have to be taken for e- even uh, continuing these efforts to what extent the testing should be encouraged and if is getting encouraged what what kind of support care mechanism should be created and to what extent it should be sustained and then how should it gradually be uh, withdrawn i i suppose this again is an important policy decision which will have to be uh, appropriately taken um, i i think uh, i would also invite brian to share his experiences i i fully agree with you dr mendele i think um Uh, there's a lot of um, the only thing I would add is that I think there's a lot more that we can be doing um, to change uh, uh, behaviors, um, and so encouraging um, the use of of masks, um, of course, is is some uh, something that we face both in India uh, as well as the U.S. and and in many many settings. Um, I think encouraging. Um, Uh, the use of masks will be important and i think especially during um uh the festival time um um now i think you know working to encourage um individuals to think uh, about social distancing during those those um this kind of critical time uh, i think will be really important some states um in india uh have used um uh periodic lockdowns um i'm i'm not sure of the status of of these lockdowns currently so for example up um was using uh weekend lockdowns um to try and uh uh, uh curb um or encourage social distancing at least on weekends um i think gujarat was was also um implementing um periodic lockdowns as well uh and um i think there's been a move away from from those periodic lockdowns and so really focusing on the public health measures that dr mendele um uh talked about in in um in lieu of of those uh lockdown measures um i think is important and and i think it's also important given the impact that lockdown measures have on on well-being and and health in other ways as well and so to avoid those lockdown measures um and focus on on kind of core public health uh response efforts i think you know is is should be a priority and i think um in a lot of places it is great so i'm going to turn to questions from the audience um we have quite a number here so i'm going to do my best to try to get through them so the first question i have here is um did the south korea event resemble your super spreader event um maybe i could just broaden this a little bit because i think there were a few super spreading um reports in from south korea but um just you know how how do you think the results from your study generalize to what you've heard about super spreading of covid-19 in in, in other settings you've covered this a little bit when talking about japan but maybe um others that you um may know about 
Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. So, so as I mentioned, um, we found uh, or super spreading um, is is a phenomenon that's been observed in other settings as well, in China, uh, South Korea, um, uh, and and elsewhere, of course, Hong Kong. Um, I, I find it interesting because you know there's there's potentially many different drivers of of um, of super spreading. Some of those would be uh, likely um, uh, very context specific. And despite that, we still see uh, super spreading happening um, in, in, multiple, uh, in multiple settings. And so I think um, uh, what the drivers of, of super spreading are and, and whether they're the same in South Korea or other settings, I think there's more research um, that's needed to, to uh, uh, shed light on that. But um, in, in terms of uh, super spreading as a phenomenon. We've 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 seen it um, in multiple different settings now. Okay. Um, and here's another question, and I'll leave it um, to the two of you uh, to decide who's best um, able to answer this. But is there any correlation with viral load or CT values of individuals identified as initiating super spreader events, or any other clinical epidemiological correlates such as disease severity, antibodies, etc.? Dr. Mendeley, is that um, a question that you? I, I think I leave that question to you, Brian. <laughs> um, I, I, I think this is an area, I think, as well, where we need additional research. Um, I'm not sure uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's super clear yet. I think there are some individuals, uh, there's some research that may suggest that um, lower CT values or, or higher, old viral, higher viral load um, um, could correlate with um, uh, more viral shedding and therefore uh, potentially um, leading to, um, this would be the biologic aspect of, of super spreading, but I think there's more research necessary in order to, to really um, understand uh, the role of, of viral load in, in um, both transmission and super spreading um, uh, uh, more broadly. No, I, I, I agree, and I would like to uh, just supplement by saying that research data on the risk factors, uh, if at all we believe that there are super spreaders, we really don't have adequate knowledge about what are the risk factors, who are those people who are spreading this virus in this particular way. So, uh, and the whole issue is if we accept that in, in the countries where this disease is really spreading rapidly, uh, uh, whether this has to be tracked down as a part of the program or whether it should be uh, taken up through systematically planned research studies. Would uh, just some local focal studies which are planned in specified countries be enough or would, would it be uh, important to take up uh, global studies like certain recent studies which have been taken as far as vaccine and uh, treatment studies are concerned. Uh, so this probably is, is one opportunity where it might be possible uh, to do global studies where if uh, people go on, go uh, say, uh, collect data, collect samples in a systematic way, and then somebody just brings many of such uh, sites together, and then uh, some novel uh, ways of looking at what exactly is happening. And here is where it might be important not, not just to look at the host factors, but maybe it might be important to look at the agent factors as well. We do not know, and the environmental factors. So uh, we then might be able to uh, really uh, understand what's happening here. But again, as, as we say, uh, it, it is also, it might be reasonable to believe that this is this is the first pandemic that uh, that has hit us in a such a such a, such a bad way, let's say, and in a such a big way that we might not be able to find all the answers in this this pandemic all alone. It might be probably, but definitely this has helped us in formulating certain hypotheses. Uh, I let us all believe that uh, super spreaders is one good hypothesis to work on, and let us prove or disprove. Great, I've got another question here. What role has the IDSP played in undertaking surveillance for COVID-19 in India? Um, maybe Dr. Mandela, do you have thoughts on that? 
Uh, I think I, IDSP is uh, is a good platform that has been created by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare that has been uh, uh, accumulating data, nationwide data on important uh, infectious diseases, uh, particularly communicable diseases uh, in the country. And uh, uh, what uh, IDSP was given primarily the role of accumulating the data at the national level which uh, they have been doing. And uh, that has been the main data source as far as uh, India is concerned. Uh, needless to say that uh, uh, every, every single state has to be also equally responsible in uh, uploading and providing the data uh, to this particular network. And uh, hence, uh, there are still some gaps which need to be plugged in certain states where data, data is not uh, free flowing right from the peripheral level right up to the central level. It's a huge country that we are talking about. And so uh, uh, we are systematically uh, bringing all the pieces together. In certain states, this has happened pretty efficiently and the I IDSP reporting has been extremely uh, regular. Whereas in other states, the data has not been uh, reporting, particularly the uh, some of the remote states of India where there are geographical challenges. Uh, the, probably the data reaching from very far remote areas to the central points in the states and then to the center creates some kind of uh, issues. Uh, also the issues which are of connectivity related issues as well. But I, I would still say that IDSP has done a good job, but we have realized that uh, I, IDSP will now have to be geared up to uh, and nicely linked up with all this uh, laboratory infrastructure that has been created in the country. Uh, see, all these years, laboratories were all linked up with, with their own uh, certain laboratories, which uh, wherein they had trained people and uh, wherein they would they were capturing the data. But during this, uh, as a response to this pan pandemic, there were so many other laboratories which have started. Uh, uh, say creating information or generating information on COVID that it would essentially be a very big challenge to get that data captured under the IDSP network. One important point I would like to mention here is in India, IDSP mainly tracks data from the public sector, the government sector, but there is a huge amount of data which also gets created uh, in the private sector as well. So for forming effective linkages to also get that data into the uh, IDSP network in real time uh, would be a major challenge and uh, we will have to work on that. Great. Um, lots of questions about testing and I'm gonna see if I can try to batch them into sort of one and maybe just either of you can react to any portion of it that you feel um, qualified to answer. So there's questions about uh, using the rapid antigen tests and um, what proportion of, rap of testing is done with rapid antigen tests versus PCR tests. The questions about whether there are concerns that this will lead to missed cases. Um, and I guess I'll, I will add to that question. If there's uh, some of the proponents of antigen testing have argued that what antigen tests miss are possibly not significant from a public health transmission standpoint, that perhaps they're better trained, they're better able to find people who are contagious versus just you know finding evidence of, of remains of viral RNA. I'm just wondering if there are any, uh, any evidence that you've seen from India on that front. And then one more question here about the use of antibody tests, um, possibly as um, a surveillance tool, I guess, to assume maybe to determine sort of prevalence of, of prior infection in, in uh, uh, parts of the country. So a bunch of questions there, and maybe um, uh, both of you can sort of pick pieces of those to answer. So uh, Dr. Mendeley, if you don't mind, I can maybe just uh, go first and, and note that I, I don't think there's any national level, um, at least publicly available statistic on the proportion of, of daily tests that are being done by antigen versus RT-PCR. Um, that said, I know that some states from, from the data that I've um, uh, seen, uh, not necessarily under Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, but other states um, uh, have uh, uh, a, a quite a high proportion of tests that are being done through um, rapid antigen uh, kits. And um, I think, of course, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Jennifer, the, the lower sensitivity of these tests is of concern. 
Um, uh, Dr. Mendeley mentioned uh, earlier in our talk that in a lot of places, um, the guidance is that if you test negative by rapid antigen test, but you still have um, uh, uh, signs and symptoms that would potentially indicate a, a, a suspected case um, that, you know, uh, it would be followed up, a negative rapid antigen test would be followed up by RT-PCR. Um, I agree with you. I think that um, that rapid antigen tests have uh, a lot of value, both in terms of the turnaround time, as well as identifying um, potentially infectious um, individuals, whereas RT-PCR, um, of course, can take, uh, uh, in some settings, upwards of, of um, well, at least in some settings in, in India, I've seen numbers as high as 72 um, hours, maybe even longer um, to get results back. Of course, that um, then raises questions around the utility of that as a, as a public health measure. Um, um, but also that uh, RT-PCR may be overly sensitive for, um, for uh, uh, infection and, and could indicate prior infection and not necessarily um, uh, an infectious um, uh, individual. And so um, uh, uh, with regard to antibody tests, um, Dr. Mendeley, I don't know if you wanna take that or if you have anything further you might wanna to add to um, these questions around uh, uh, RT-PCR versus rapid antigen tests. Uh, no, thanks. Thanks, Brian. I think I did explain my views uh, during the uh, earlier explanation when uh, when the question was asked to me, and uh, and you gave a very comprehensive uh, answer to this question. So nothing bad uh, on antigen testing uh, versus RT PCR testing. Uh, just about the an antibody testing is concerned. As of now, I think this is uh, strictly been limited to various serological surveys that have been conducted in different parts of the country. Uh, they have been conducted, uh, one of the earlier surveys uh, was conducted by Indian Council of Medical Research, where the, uh, the, the prevalence in the general community was not picked up to be pretty high. But that survey was done pretty early in, uh, uh, in the pandemic situation in, in the country. Uh, so subsequently, uh, five or six months after the first few cases in India got reported, uh, the, the serv serological surveys were done in big metropolitan cities like Mumbai, they were done in Pune, they were done in Delhi, and uh, the, uh, quite a few that nearly 40%, anywhere between 40% and 55% of the people who were sampled actually got uh, an, uh, a showed antibody positive result. Recent, uh, also, a similar result came from the state of uh, uh, Maharashtra in a place called Nagpur. One of the recent uh, studies has uh, also come up uh, from uh, the other part of the country as well and uh, from the other cities uh, as well, which shows uh, to the tune of 60% uh, positivity in uh, certain highly populated states here. What it primarily uh, tells us is that uh, this antibody, uh, antibody test possibly just indicates that these are the people who have been exposed to this particular virus at some point of time here. So uh, again, uh, we don't have uh, a test which is very clearly able to distinguish IgM antibody from IgG antibody as of now. Had there been an IgM antibody detection uh, test possible, uh, we would probably uh, had uh, one more ammunition uh, added to our early detection of acute infections in that particular case. But here we still do not have a reliable test which is able to clearly give us IgM positive uh, ELISA. Most of the tests that are currently available either are able to uh, they are uh, able to tell us whether it is IgG IgM positive, thereby meaning that it could be positive to either, either of these two antibodies here. So I, I do feel and I agree that, uh, that these tests as of now have no diagnostic significance per se, but uh, they might be quite useful <coughs> in the sense uh, they might be uh, important in understanding as to what level of uh, the spread has occurred in the overall community when the community based surveys have undertaken. But I just wanted to turn over to Brian. I think there's a larger um, team to thank uh, for their work on these issues. Brian? 
Thank you, uh, Jennifer. I, I just wanted to take um, just a moment to um, note that you know the the research that I presented on um, uh, was really the 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 hard work of a, a lot of individuals, um, both within the governments of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, as well as um, collaborators at the Center for Disease Dynamics, uh, Economics and Policy (CDEP), uh, as well as University of of California Berkeley. And so, just wanted to make um, note that I'm presenting this work on behalf of a lot of individuals who have who have put a lot of um, uh, effort into this. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists for their informative and timely insights. And thanks to you, our audience, for listening in and for submitting your thoughtful questions. I wish we had much more time. I could listen to these folks all day long, but um, unfortunately we've now reached the end of our program. Thanks so much for participating.